Hello, I'm Patrick Parker, the CEO of Empower ID, and this is a short demo video of integrating user managed access, which is an extension to OAuth, with Open Policy Agent as a policy decision point for external authorization. So this scenario is really about uh, self-enforcement, so applications that are written to support external authorization, meaning that the application does not make decisions internally, that it calls out in some way to an external policy decision point or authorization server that will make its decisions. Of course, it's a more uh, scalable model for centralized policy management, or as we're going to see in this case, even centralized policy authoring and audit, but distributed policy decisioning. So in our example scenario, uh, we're going to use, just as an example, uh, user managed access, which is an extension to OAuth 2, um, which allows applications to uh, delegate the decisioning to an external authorization server. So uh, the main, main change between UMA, or one of the, the big goals uh, between UMA and regular OAuth, is splitting out uh, the requesting party and the resource owner because in typical OAuth the user they're one and the same I'm allowing the application to have access to APIs on my behalf whereas with UMA the requesting party could be another user using an application accessing APIs and the, the resource owner who owns the resources is offline or not that same person and they have the ability via sharing or policies to grant other users such as the requesting party access to their UMA protected resources. So in this flow we have a, a medical application where we might have x-rays from the x-ray machine uh, being automatically registered as UMA resources with our authorization server uh, with all the metadata necessary as to whose uh, x-ray is that. Um, there's actually a, uh, a, an UMA uh, API for that to register your resources. And now in, in our flow, we're going to have the user using the application, Dr. Alice, using a medical app to view x-rays, attempting to view an x-ray uh, owned by Bob. She's trying to view Bob's x-ray. And in the, the UMA flow, basically the client application is going to try to make a call to the API to view the x-ray. It's going to call the what's called the resource server, which is the server serving up the resources, the API in this case. Uh, on the first call, she's not even authenticated, so it's going to give a 401, but what happens is that the resource server identifies from the call exactly which resource she's trying to access or resources. So it's, it's responsible for resource resolution. And UMA, that's very tangible. It gets down to passing a resource ID or multiple resource IDs. The resource server is also responsible for determining uh, which UMA scopes were required. And UMA scopes are like the rights or the actions uh, in an ABAC world. Which actions was Alice trying to perform against which resources? And then it will make a call to the authorization server. And since it's, you know, uh, anonymous, you'll get a 401, but the authorization server, uh, the UMA server, will return a ticket number. And the resource server turns this ticket number to the client. Now, the, the client can then get authenticated to whatever it needs to do and make a call uh, sending in its, uh, and in our case, we're going to send in our OpenID Connect ID token uh, with the ticket number. And then the authorization server will evaluate any policies necessary to determine if that requesting party user has access to the res resources that were being requested with the scopes that were being requested. And the UMA authorization server will issue an, it's an UMA grant, but it, it can be pluggable. And that's what we're going to show here, that the authorization server can plug into any type of policy decision point backend. Uh, it's not really limited. Could be, again, RBAC, ABAC, PBAC. Um, in our case, we're just going to show uh, using open policy agent. 
which is a uh, cloud native computing foundation incubating standard for a very distributed uh, microservice style uh, policy decision point. So we're going to look at that next. So Open Policy Agent, as I mentioned, uh, it's open source. It's a general purpose policy engine that unifies policy enforcement across the stack. It's often used for policies for enforcement of uh, infrastructure policies like Kubernetes and other things. But it's also being used for authorization. It can really evaluate any type of policy. And the benefit is that it is an extremely lightweight Docker container that can run right beside your microservices like a sidecar pattern and it can scale with the microservices and because it's it's distributed and decentralized it doesn't phone home or call back to a central source you really can scale it uh, linearly with your microservices you don't have to worry about uh, centralized bottlenecks now it does allow itself to support enforcing policies that would be defined centrally. So centralized policy authoring, so you have auditability and control. Because the way that it works, it's very simple. It has a REST API to receive requests and to answer, uh, give back decisions, authorization decisions. And it makes its decisions based upon a policy file, which is just the rules written in Rego, which is a general purpose policy language. Uh, and evaluating those policies against data received in the call itself uh, it could be the, the user's identity token, coupled with or in conjunction with data in one or more JSON files that are locally local on the uh, OPA decision service itself. So now in our example, it's a very simplistic policy file we'll look at and a very simplistic single JSON data file. Uh, what the policy just checks if you're a valid user, uh, a list has in a, if the user requesting the x-ray is uh, the x-ray owner's doctor. So it's very simple. But OPA uh, supports pulling down these JSON data files from a REST API or having them pushed. So the policies could be authored centrally, and as long as they're uh, able to be pushed down or pulled uh, locally as JSON files, then the policies can be enforced locally and offline in a distributed fashion using OPA. And that's, that's what we want to take a look at here. Okay, so switching gears here, we're just going to take a look at my server, logged into my server, and I have my Docker Compose file for my open policy agent just for this my json file here's my image i'm running <clears throat> for my open policy agent and we're just going to start that up here so we're running it's listening uh, for something to call it for decisions and um, in our simple scenario as i mentioned we're just going to have a very simple rego policy file which basically checks if the user it's being passed in. The user, the owner of the X-ray, uh, is present in the uh, user's list. It's going to check if the doctor passed in is present in the doctor's list, and then if the doctor is a uh, doctor for the user. So it's a very simple one. Uh, th these uh, the policies can be very simple and allow for just evaluating the policies that are authored uh, centrally. So they can just evaluate that and you don't have to have a lot of complex logic here because they're just enforcing policies authored centrally. In this case, it's just a very simple policy also. Now we'll look at our data file, which again, uh, the Rego evaluates this data plus any data in the request. And we can see we have a list of users, just three users. We have three doctors and we have a user to doctor relationships. So we can see that in our example, Bob, his doctor is Alice. Whereas Slavko has three doctors. So when we make a request, it's going to evaluate the rule against this data plus any data being passed in. And again, if the policies are authored centrally, 
you can push down just the data needed for the microservice that this open policy agent is protecting. So you could be authoring who has access to do what in a microservice centrally and pushing just the data needed down to enforce those decisions locally for that microservice. And then of course, many microservices. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna initiate some uh, UMA requests. Okay, to simulate my scenario, um, I have a Postman, and I'm going to start the uh, UMA flow. And as I mentioned in the, in the first uh, part of the flow, we have our Dr. Alice using her medical uh, records viewing uh, x-ray app, and she's going to try to view an x-ray. And in this case, this x-ray happens to be Bob's x-ray. So she's going to make requests to the resource server API. And what's going to happen here is that it's going to return a 401. So she does not have access uh, to that. Of course, in this case, she's not even authenticated. And, and so she made an, an attempt to load this x-ray, make a rest call. The, and what happened on the back end is that the resource server hosting this uh, x-rays API, it determined uh, what was she trying to access, which resource, and which scopes. And then it uh, made a request to the UMA authorization server, and it received back a ticket. As we can see here, here's our ticket number. And we're going to copy that. At this point, it's returned to the client, and the client can make a call to request an access token. So the server knows from this ticket what was the resource, what were the scopes being requested, uh, and it can make a call. Now, just to, qu to quickly look at this. On our server, this is our very simple uh, UMA medical records app. We have our scopes defined for each of our types of uh, resources. So x-rays you could download, uh, you could uh, delete. We have uh, previously registered via the UMA uh, API our resources. So we can see we have Bob's x-ray registered here, uh, owned by Bob. And this is the unique identifier for the resource set or the resource representing this x-ray. So the resource server, when the request came in for that x-ray, it resolved that uh, Dr. Alice was trying to access this x-ray, Bob's x-ray, and which scopes or actions was he trying to perform. So we'll go back to our postman now. So we have our ticket. We got our 401 unauthorized. We got the ticket. And now we can call uh, and just get a regular OAuth token, an ID token in this case, for Dr. Alice. So here's her ID token. And then we're going to make uh, a call for the uh, UMA grant. Here we go. Let's see that. So we're calling for an UMA grant, an UMA ticket. We're going to pa uh, pass in our uh, ticket that we got there back from our 401. We're also going to pass in um, Alice, Dr. Alice's ID token so it knows who she is. And we can actually take a look at what's in this ID token if we want real quickly. Let's go to JWT.io. We can see what's being sent in. And of course, that can be evaluated by the as part of the rules uh, if desired. So let me paste this in here. And we can see that we've got, OK, Dr. Alice, her email. Uh, looks like we've got some business roles and locations that she's a doctor at Mercy Hospital. So the rules could be using that as well. Uh, in this case, I think we're just using it for her identity. So we're going to pass in that ID token into our UMA call to try to get an uh, access token. Pass that in as a claim token. And then we're going to send that. And now it looks like we got back an access token. So if we didn't have access as Dr. Alice to the resource and scopes being requested, we, we wouldn't get this back. But in this case, we got an access token back. We can see what's in that. Let's go take a look at that one. And we can see the access token is granting the permissions for that resource set uh, ID, which is Bob's uh, x-ray in this case. And it looks like the, the scope being requested was view. So now there's an access token that says, okay, Dr. Alice can, has for the resource Bob's x-ray, the view scope. So when she makes that next call to try to view the x-ray, she can pass in her token as a bearer token. 
And of course, the resource server now will see in that that she does have access to view Bob's x-ray. Uh, so that's just a quick example that shows how uh, you can integrate uh, an UMA on the front end request with something very distributed like uh, Open Policy Agent. Now, just to take a peek here, you can see here that we saw the request coming in. So this is our uh, Docker container running OPA. And we can see that there was a request. The result was allow. So we see that, you know, Dr. Alice was the input uh, user bot for user Bob. And that the response based upon our rules, our very simple rules, was uh, an allow. So that's why we were allowed to get the uh, authorization token from the UMA server. So I hope that you found this useful. Uh, just a quick example. Of course, uh, UMA doesn't have to be integrated with OPA. OPA can be independent of UMA and UMA independent of OPA with a different type of policy uh, decision point on the back end. So thank you very much.